record on the computer. Hey everybody, I am here with Tomer Weiss, Weiss, Weiss probably. Um, Tomer is pretty interesting. I found Tomer on a class which I took on Udemy, which, uh, which I just sort of like uh, gambled on, thought you know, maybe it's good, maybe it's not. And it was an incredibly excellent course, which is about Nidra Yoga and astral projection. Now, the funny thing is, in like some of the courses I've done, I've talked a lot about Nidra Yoga because I found that doing this body awareness meditation was um, was really useful. But um, Tomer, it looks like you're a therapist and um, mm -hmm. you you help people with trauma, sexual combat trauma, interestingly. And I noticed that one of your other classes is about anxiety attacks. So before we get into all this like stuff about like the mystical and Nidra Yoga and astral projection, it sounds like you've got a pretty storied past, right? What's with all the trauma and anxiety, Tomer? <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess so. I guess so. Um, wow. You want you want my backstory? Uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit. I mean, like you, you're a therapist, but you said you'd actually, I was just reading there quickly, and it was insane that you'd uh, been involved in combat. And you're in Israel, right? Yes. And so, so all Israelis are drafted into the army, whether we, we like to or not. And uh, I personally was a combatant, so I've I've seen combat firsthand, and uh, I've I've suffered the consequences of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Did that um, did that happen? <clears throat> I mean, you've obviously at some point. I I don't know how old you are. I'm looking at your hair. I'm going to say you're 32, and uh, <laughs> right. But I'm saying that. Um, I think you, you, uh, you you've always paid off. Right, you know, trying to help you out, buddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that you went off on a sort of spiritual journey here. And um, when did that when did that happen? You've had this, you were drafted, I guess, into combat, which was probably around the age of 18, around there. And then at some mm -hmm. point you decided <clears throat> to be spiritual. Now, in my head, I'm just making this up, but in my head, I'm thinking, well, what happened to Tomer is he went through all his anxiety, and then he had to learn to meditate to deal with the anxiety. And then, well, you know, as, you know it's, it's 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 you're you're quite spot on, except for a little fact that, which is that I I I had this spiritual bone inside of me from from you know early childhood. But uh, I looked at it in adolescence when I was twelve. I I picked up. Uh, a book about the the power Joseph Mur Murphy the the power of the subconscious mind and I was reading Carl Carl Jung and I started being interested in ESP and uh, astral projection um, Kabbalah things like this so so I had this kind of uh, uh, spiritual bone in me um, but it is true that I the way that that I, I really entered into it was that after the army, a lot of Israelis go to unwind. They they travel around the world, uh, and and one of the destinations in, is India. And I was actually in India, and I had a kind of flashback from the army. Uh, I was a little bit lost there, and uh, there was no one really able to to support me. Um, and so somebody was recommending, "Oh, you should go do vipassana." And so instead of trekking, which was my my uh, my plan at the time, I ended up uh, doing a Vipassana retreat. And then actually th there wasn't space for the Vipassana retreat. So I went and I did an uh, introduction to Buddhism with uh, uh, the venerable Rubina Curtin. Uh, and then a Vipassana and then a yoga class. And then it, it just kind of snowballed from there. Wow. So that's interesting. So that was, and you spent some time in India, didn't you? Was didn't I, did you go back there a bunch of times, or was that just a, a short trip? Yeah, like, no, for, no. For I, example, I, for example, I came to Chile for a for a year. I've been here for fifteen years now. Um, mm -hmm. I never went back. So is that the kind of thing that happened to you, or did you actually go home and then come back again? I, I went and I came back, and I went and I came back, and I think all in all, I spent maybe four or five years uh, in total in India, and then another four or five in Thailand. Yeah, and so you yeah. were like, um, 
I'm sure there was a lot of stuff involved with that. But when did you start thinking? Because I mean, like going through your course, I mean, you you seem to know what you're talking about. You've got a lot of knowledge. Now, a lot of times knowledge can come from reading, but you've actually got like experiential knowledge. So when do you when did it happen that you went from an introduction to Buddhist class? What when did it occur to you that this was something that would be worth pursuing seriously? Because you've already got this like as a as a well, child having this interest in ESP and astral projection, and then somehow you did this Buddhist thing, and you found did that sort of connect with those other experiences that you'd had? I was I was very greedy. I was very greedy for for or thirsty, you know. Uh, if if I want to be if I want to be kind with myself, I was thirsty for spiritual information and spiritual knowledge, and so I I I, I couldn't get enough. I just went from one course to another to another. And when you start reading uh, uh, some of the some of the books, like uh, Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda, they present this really magical universe, and, and, I, and I wanted that. You know, it was something that I wanted wanted since childhood. But in in a sense, it's it's almost like going to to the army cut me off from that. You know, uh, put me really in, into into harsh life, just just mundane life face to face. And so this was kind of like a return to my to my previous desires, and and there was so much of it in in in, in India uh, when I was growing up. The, the internet wasn't really a thing; it just started. Um, I like I said, you, you took a decade off of uh, off of my age. Um, internet was just starting. I, I remember surfing when I was like in high school. Uh, Google just it was. Google, they just made Google. And there were these directories uh, and there was this uh, occult search engine. I don't remember the name right now. It was a directory and you could go uh, uh, to, to these websites. I was really thirsty for the information, but it was never accessible. I really tried reading these texts and trying to understand them. But when I had proper instructions from proper teacher that meditated themselves, uh, uh, that, that were doing these things themselves, then suddenly it started to click. So I can't say it was a specific thing, but you know, I did a 10 day Vipassana retreat and I was like, wow, this is different. I didn't even know what it, what it was that was different. It was just different. Um, it's interesting when you're saying about the books, I also did the same thing. I downloaded these archives of like, and gigs of like occult books and I like did my best to read through them all stuff but I don't know if you've had this experience but one of the experiences that I had was like you'd read these books about magic and stuff and you're like <clears throat> they all seem to be saying sort of similar things and you know I try like to meditate and I couldn't really meditate and it just I was like this all seems like it's just imaginary like bullshit kind of stuff this is nonsense um and I didn't realize until later that it's true that they all said the same thing but there was one thing that was missing. And I think the thing that's missing is probably what you're saying when you actually work with a teacher. And so what I realized reading the books was that when I went back and read them again, so for example, there's a book by uh, Israel Regardi called The Middle Pillar. And in The Middle Pillar, you know, he talks about bringing light down and you're like, dude, what? And you, you try and imagine it and you're like, dude, this is just like imagination, right? But, uh, but um, once, you know, I went through this initiation thing with my shaman. And after that, I started doing it. And it was like, it was real. Then you could feel energy coming down. So it's almost like you need, you need like some kind of initiation. Because like when I went back and read those magical books, they all actually talk about this energy. They all talk about energy, but it wasn't real for me. Did you have that experience where you were reading stuff and it didn't seem real? And then like later on, after you worked with these teachers, it felt real or was it a different experience for you? It, I, it was about the amount of practice. I'm, okay. I'm just, uh, I'm running an, an online uh, uh, meditation course at the moment uh, with some colleagues. And one of the things that, that I shared there was that when you learn to meditate, I see in the West, people are doing like five minute meditation, 10 minute meditation, half an hour meditation. And when I did that first Vipassana, that was approximately eight hours of meditation per day, plus a couple more of listening to a lecture for 10 days. That's like 80 hours of meditation, 80 yeah. to 100 hours of meditation. 
And, and that's what it takes. And I find that that, that is what makes the difference. When, 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 you, when you don't jump in, it won't work. When it comes in like little bites, sometimes you get a grace. Sometimes there's like a, an accumulation of factors um, and there's grace, like something from your past is, 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 is helping you to, to gain something, but that's momentary. And it then requires a lot of effort to return back to that uh, experience. And I think that's what made the difference. I was practicing, um, so after, after doing this Vipassana and after doing this introduction to Buddhism, I did some yoga courses and I was pra practicing for eight to 10 hours per day. Like that was my day. I was just doing, yeah, I was just doing pranayamas, asanas, uh, meditation, and, and there, there wasn't such a thing as doing meditation for less than an hour. It was like, you don't do less than an hour. I only started to feel like I was meditating after 45 minutes, you know? Wow. Um, and I think that's what it takes. I think it takes really going straight into it. And that's what makes the difference. And when that's it comes amazing. to something- like, When you're meditating, like for hours, and I've done that myself, but like, um, what, um, I think a lot of people, like you said, they think that meditation is about relaxation or, and, and they think it's difficult to meditate for that amount of time. Is there something, what, what made it possible for you to meditate for that length of time? Doing it with other people. <laughs> See, really? when you're meditating with, with 15 other people or with 100 other people in the room, and after 20 minutes, you want to get up because you're new. <laughs> You haven't done meditation you want to get up and you open your eyes and it's like everybody's sitting and then you just feel uncomfortable standing up because yeah. nobody does that so you close your eyes and you wait a little bit more and then you you know it really is how it goes it's really interesting no was there a time i remember there was a time for me i was i i couldn't meditate and i was at i was i i teach classes here in chile and um I was in my office one day and my mother was there waiting. Uh, we had to wait for a couple of hours and I thought, I'm just going to try meditating because I get nothing to do. So I tried meditating and I didn't know what I was doing, but there was a point where I suddenly felt like I was getting elevated a little bit. And I was like, something happened. Finally, I've been like trying these like five, 10 minute uh, meditations for a while. And it's like, something is different. Was there a moment? I mean, it sounds like there was a moment for you, like when that happened. Like, how long did it take for you meditating? Like, was it a year before you actually felt like, wow, this is... Oh, it was after the Vipassana. Um, no, I, I think that the first time that I, that I uh, experienced one of these expansions was actually with a technique which is called Laya Yoga. Um, it's a technique on med of meditating on internal sounds with a mantra. Wow. And, and I had this experience. I was I was sitting um, in in this yoga hall. Uh, this was uh, going on in Thailand, and sitting in this yoga hall, and I felt that I could feel a motorbike drive inside of me, and I and I knew someone was coming to the yoga hall. Wow. Um, and I could. It, it's like I could feel their motorbike on the road. On the main road taking a left turn to the to the driveway which was about 150 meters or so uh until until reaching the 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 hall and then i knew that the meditation was going to be over very soon because that would happen only only when uh uh you know somebody would come only at the end of a certain session be prior to the next session now i can't i can't tell you because the people were coming so i don't know if a part of my subconscious mind heard some of the uh, uh motorbikes coming some of the scooters coming and then another part was projecting that this person was going to come i yeah, yeah i don't know that is interesting that to try, it's interesting to try and sort of discern the differences between like um like what you like visions imagination right I mean, who knows the laya yoga thing that's meditating on sound of the mantra is well, that something the, you, is that something you could explain briefly or no 
You see, my yeah. thing is like I've got no formal practice. I I've I've got lots of experience meditating, but I've never actually and I, I've learned everything from books. And then I had this sort of like kundalini thing, so it's like it seems easy now, whereas before I couldn't do anything. But I don't actually formal training, so I've got a technique of working the sound too. But I'm interested to hear like the like you've actually studied it properly, so I'm interested to hear what that might be like, you know. Okay, so so first of all, laya means this dissolving, and, and the idea is that that we dissolve into something, and by dissolving into it, we lose our um, our sense of who we are and we gain a new sense of who we are and this new sense of who we are is whatever it is that we are dissolving into and so you want to choose very carefully what what you dissolve into hmm. um, and then for for if, if you close your ears you're going to hear a kind of ringing sound and in the west people call this uh, tinnitus uh, and it's considered an ailment. It's like there's something wrong with me because I'm hearing this sound. It can really bother people. And uh, in most cases, I think about 85% of cases, there is no physiological reason for hearing this kind of beeping noise in the ear. Um, and the, in the, the, the Indians called this uh, the nada, uh, the anahata nada. Anahata, you probably heard this name of the chakra, uh, Anahata chakra. Anahata means unstruck. And so these are the unstruck sounds uh, because the sound is always made by, by uh, striking. Ah, I just gave my Tibetan bowl, but this also works. It's not a Tibetan bowl though. Uh, so I can't make a nice resounding sound, but sound is made by, by, by hitting two things together. Um, but striking two things together. And this are, these are the unstruck sounds. These are echoes that, 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 that are in the universe. And, and the most basic echo uh, of the universe is said to be that of Om, more, more correctly pronounced Aum. And so there's a technique which is called Nada Anusandana, uh, where you listen to these sounds in a certain way. Um, and, and you're supposed to follow these sounds back to the source. Because according to the, the Hindu mm. cosmogony, the, the Hindu theory of the development of the universe, the universe manifests in sound. A lot of the, a lot of the ancient uh, civilizations believed that word was creating uh, the universe. In the beginning, there was the word and the word was the, with God and God was the word or Genesis. God said let there be light and there was light. He didn't imagine light. He didn't uh, manifest like God said. So for ancient mm -hmm. cultures, the word was really important. The universe was created out of word and, and the same goes for the, for the, the Hindu vision about how the wor world was created. And this vision developed over time until it, it wasn't really like before word, there was sound. And this sound of the creation of the universe is this Om. Um, and so in, in Nada, Anus, uh, Nada Anusandana, which is the, the practice of, of listening to these Nadas or in Laya Yoga, uh, we listen to these sounds and do things with them. <clears throat> in Nada Anusandana, we listen to the, to these sounds in the, in the right ear, uh, specifically. And, uh, the idea oh. is to go through a progression of how the sound, uh, manifests, uh, how it, uh, how the pitch elevates and how the, not just the pitch, but the form, there's some difference in how the sound sounds like. Um, and that's in, in, in Nada Anusandana and in Laya Yoga, which was what I was doing, you emit a certain mantra and you listen to the, to the, um, to the feedback in a sense, you, you listen to the Nada after emitting that mantra. But Laya Yoga requires initiation. Because um, if, if, if you don't activate the mantra in a certain way, it's like you lose it. You can say it, but then it, it, the, what you're going to be listening to is not going to be the mantra. And then it's an, it's an open gateway to, to not necessarily harmonious places and usually not harmonious places. Uh, that's kind of it uh, in a nutshell. That's really interesting. I think it's interesting because like I... Um haven't been initiated in um, any yoga or meditation practices, but 
one of the things I started doing is I found like a lot of connection with this Om Mani Padme Hum with a bunch of mantras, but that one in particular. But one of the things I found myself doing, just sort of instinctively meditating on it, is following the shape, almost like like you know like oh uh, like it's got curvature on it. The M's get like a curvature on it, so I follow the curvature down. Then you wait, and then changing the velocity and the um, it's it's like a it's like a journey. You can like travel just on the sound of this. Yes. It's unbelievable, and to me, it was unbelievable. But I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, wow, is this there's a, type there's of a whole thing? science around it? There's a whole science around it, and I and I have to tell you that that the Indians are quite strict. Also, the Tibetans that, yeah. that it requires an initiation, and without an initiation, it can be dangerous. I don't know to tell you if that's correct or not. I I, I tend to to follow these things. What's interesting about the ma mantra Omani Padme Hum is that. Uh, this is supposed to be the, the mantra of Chenrezig, of Avalokiteshvara, yeah. uh, which is the, the, the patron uh, bodhisattva of, uh, of Tibet and, and uh, the bodhisattva of which the Dalai Lama is supposed to be a, a reincarnation. And what's interesting about Avalokiteshvara in this context is that there, there is this image that Avalokiteshvara, he has a, a a thousand heads or ten thousand heads. He he is listening to all of the suffering of the uh, of the world. Um, he hears all of the sounds of the world. And there's two interpretations for this. The first is that Avalokiteshvara is is uh, uh, just hearing everyone's suffering. That's why he hears all of the sounds of the world. The world. But there's another interpretation, which I don't know how how prevalent it is in Tibet, but in a, in a Chinese school, uh, Huayen, of, uh, of Chinese Buddhism, that they also follow Avalokiteshvara. They say that the technique that Avalokiteshvara used in order to reach his enlightenment was listening to the subtle sounds of Nada. And that's oh, why yeah. he is the one that hears all of the sounds of the universe because that is his, uh, uh, that is the meditation that, that brought him to his, Bodhisattva hood. So it's quite interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, you know, there's a bunch of things you said, and it's like I'm not going to be able to get through all of this stuff chatting with you today, probably, because there's a bunch of things you've said over the last 30 minutes, which are really <laughs> interesting. One of the last things sure. you just said was um it's dangerous without initiation. No, I uh yeah, so I'm interested. Have you had any like um dangerous experiences yourself i mean it sounds like you've been actually pretty well guided so i well i don't know how was it had anything scary happen to you in meditation well scary things happen in meditation um for sure seeing all sorts of images there's there's scary stuff that can happen in meditation for sure yeah, yeah. I, i've never i've never really meditated with something that I didn't have the initiation to. Okay. Um, um, because I, I just got, I, I, I was pretty lucky here, I guess. I got, I didn't know how to meditate. I read these books. This is part of my uh, spiritual uh, library. So, you know, this is one of the one of the first books that I read, uh, Tibetan Yoga and Secret Doctrines. And you'd be amazed what's in here, but uh, you can't really make sense of how to use it. And the, the translation of the mantras of all things are, is just horrendous in this book, at least in the version yeah. that, that I have here. Um, so I, I, by the time that I could figure out what to do with meditation and then be able to take this book and pull out the mantras from here and do stuff which might be dangerous for me. Um, I already had enough uh, enough mantras and enough initiations that I, I wouldn't I wouldn't need to do that. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Guidance is the key. I swear to God, I've had so many crazy experiences like meditating, and you don't know what you're meditating on, and then. And then things, crazy things happen, you know? Um, and you know, for me, I think this is interesting. Like for me, what happened to me, and I always talk about this, I guess, too much on my channel, but the, uh, for me, what started happening is evocation of spirits, right? So uh, 
the first one that I was aware of was a demon in my mother's living room. And then, you know, and then later on, like lots of different kinds of spirits would evoke. And I didn't really know why or what was going on. And like, it, for, here's, a, here's another good example. One time I was sitting watching YouTube and there was this old guy who was a magician. He was a holy magician. And he was talking, he was a very sort of sage guy and he had a video and I was looking at him and there was like a slight curvature to his nose. And I just looked at the curvature of the nose and this happens to me sometimes. It's almost like, it's almost like a, the form or the shape becomes almost like a sigil or something and so as i was watching this video boom there's an evocation and two uh, cherubim i guess come out and it's like uh, they're flying around my head and it seemed really it seemed like wow this guy is a holy magician now i'm not trying to i don't know what i'm doing at the time at the time i really didn't know what i'm doing now i kind of know a little bit more but at the time i was really Things were happening. I didn't understand why. Anyway, so I'm like, wow, this is amazing. They're like holy angels. Anyway, the holy angels went into my head and started going through the uh, contents of my mind, which we can assume was not pristine. And um, it was kind of like it was kind of like the scene. It was kind of like the scene in the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, where these spirits come out of the uh, Ark of the Covenant, right? And it's like they they're they're unpleasant. They come out gloriously, but then they turn into they turn negative if you are not up to the same level as they are. So that happened to me. And it was really... Well, uh, did they turn negative or was it your own negativity? Oh, no. They were negative. What happened is they started judging me. Because I think what happened was that they were from such a high level of purity, if you will. And I don't measure up to that level of purity. And so it was almost like they were trying to eliminate me from this space of consciousness. And so it was like an attack. They attacked me is what happened. And um, that sounds weird. Oh no, dude, it was weird. I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you it was not weird. This is the funny thing is, is this is like a small example of some of the experiences about it. It's been crazy. But for me, I've done a lot of plant medicines, right? And I don't know if you've done any of these psychedelic drugs, but I got involved for a couple of years with an ayahuasca group in Chile and then did years of like plant dietas of like various other plants. So everybody talks about ayahuasca. But then there's Sharik Sanango and Bob and Sana and Wyatt Akaspi and all these other things. And so what happened is as a result of doing all those plants, like I like I started like during the nighttime, I would wake up and like plant spirits would come and they'd start like sending information to me about healing and this kind of stuff. So there was a huge, there was a huge aspect of this, which kind of opened, I guess the plants opened up and then the shaman came and did something to me, some kind of initiation where I where I went from not knowing what was happening because like that experience with the cherubim and with the demons that just scared me at the time I had no idea what was going on and it scared the hell out of me but after the shaman sang inside of my chakras uh everything changed and then it was like oh and all of a sudden I, I could see energy and I was able to control it and I was able to balance it and I had no idea what I was doing but everything just made sense all of a sudden I'm like wow um why am I talking about this? Um, oh, because we're talking about negative experiences. So like there's these negative experiences that, uh, that I've had as a result of, of not being trained properly. And I think this happens in like Amazonian shaman quite a lot, shamanism quite a lot, especially for, for gringos, people who are not part of their culture. They might throw you into the deep end and just let's watch the gringos struggle for a while and see what happens, you know, and they just sort of watch and have an entertaining Sunday evening maybe. Um, but in your case, it's been different. You've been like uh, involved with the uh, with this training experience. Now, this is one of the things. Also, like you were saying that your experience of uh, the profundity of meditation came from extended practice, from hours and hours of practice. Um, What would you say? Because we were saying that we were saying earlier that, you know, people don't people think that meditation is about relaxation. Right. Um, but that doesn't seem to be what it's about. When did it occur to you? That there was more to it. And like, when did you did you start having mystical experiences during meditation? It sounds like you did. You started having visions and stuff and seeing things. Mm hmm. 
I, you know, I would say that the first practices which I which I did were were uh, Robert Bruce's practices for astral projection, which uh, involve creative visualization. You, you need to visualize your your chakras and um, and then do some of these uh, astralization processes. And so, if, if anything, what 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 first was for me meditation was uh, was guided meditation, this kind of guided visualization. And then I would say that my next encounter with this was already in a formulated way where meditation was, was defined. So we can have this, and, and as I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm working on an online course in meditation. So I, I really sat down to, to properly define the term meditation. And it's a big story around the definition of, of what is meditation. Um, and uh, I like to be really inclusive, but at the same time, I'm not very politically correct. I, I don't like columbusing. Um, and, I, and I like us always- uh, what's, what's columbusing? I haven't heard that phrase before. Columbusing? Really? No, never Columbusing is, is, is uh, white men who go to all sorts of places and then they believe that they discovered America. Oh, oh so the colonization of the, other cultures. Okay, yeah. yeah the okay. appropriation of, of, of other cultures, but, but it's more, for me, it's it, the way I, I I like to define terms. You know, it's really yeah. important for me. So we so we for me, Columbusing means white men yeah. believing that they discovered America when they didn't. Yeah. So it's like it's like we define meditation again, but there's already a medita a definition for meditation. So why do we need to make a new one? Um. And and so. If we if we look at meditation, meditation, what it means, it can mean quite a lot of things, but not entirely free for all. But it usually, I, there they did a research. Uh, there there was a bunch. Uh, they 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 made a research trying to define the the term meditation, and they took these experts and and they did a Delphi design they call it, uh, where they kind of they define and they let each other hear the definitions and go something like that. I'm not sure exactly how it's constructed. Mm -hmm. And uh, they reached a definition which said that there are three key principles in, in meditation. Yeah. Um, and one of them is that it requires some kind of technique. And the second is that it requires that there, that there not be an effort for, um, for achieving the meditative state. So the, for me, there was always this technique. I don't remember what the third one was, by the way. Um, and they had like seven or, or something like this, which were pr pretty common in most meditations. But in general, uh, the, the first definition that I had of meditation was from uh, Patanjali. You know, the, the term meditation, it comes from, from uh, uh, Christian uh, contemplative traditions. Uh, meditatio in, in, in Latin, and please don't judge me on my Latin. I, I don't speak Latin. I can, I read it in some books, but I don't speak it. Sanskrit, okay, I can, you can, you can, if I make a mistake pronouncing something in Sanskrit, please slap I'm me on ready, my back. I'm ready to correct you with the Latin, right? <laughs> Thank no, you. Not really. So, um, and, and, and this, the term meditation has been used as a, uh, uh, as a translation for the, the word dhyana from from uh, from from Sanskrit, and dhyana is there's there's a few definitions of it, but in general it's it's a certain uh, state of consciousness which happens after we concentrate on something very intensely, and then we let go of that concentration, like when we're so concentrated that we don't need to make any more of an effort to concentrate and something in the mind has has changed and it's usually defined as if i want to meditate on this on this acorn then it's like I, I i have this acorn in front of me and i'm trying to think in a sense just a, on this acorn uh, because be aware is more uh, is a better term but let's say it's to think and as i'm doing this suddenly i'm like i'm getting distracted to this book over here which is in, in our metaphor, it's a thought. Suddenly a thought comes into my head. It's not about the acorn anymore. It's like, hmm, I was, I wonder what, what uh, uh, what's his name doing right now? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm meditating. And 
I bring my attention back to the A chord. Now, people usually get really frustrated, like, oh my God, my, 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 my mind went away. This is so horrendous. And I usually tell beginner meditators, no, no, no. This is the process of meditation. The process of meditation is the process of, of bringing, or the process of concentration, because I'll, I'll touch it in a moment, but the process of concentration, which is the first step towards becoming meditative, because they say we can't meditate. It's not something that we can, because in meditation, there's a let go, so we can't do it. But in the preparation to become meditative, we concentrate. And so this is the act of concentration. It's not about staying single pointed on this, on this acorn. It's about this process of bringing the mind, recollecting the mind again and again into the acorn every time it, it runs away to another place. And this seems super boring. Why would I bring my attention to the acorn again and again and again? But as I'm starting to do this, my mind does start to hover around this acorn until it just sits with this acorn and it becomes unmoving. And this is when I am ekagrata, when I am single po pointedly concentrated in this acorn. Nothing exists beyond this acorn. And not only that, but specifically the way I've been concentrating. And if I let go, if, if there comes a moment where I don't need to bring my mind by, back to the acorn, my mind is just in the acorn, and I let go, it's like my consciousness. I, I brought all of, my, all of my consciousness, all of my mind to a single point, and now I'm letting it expand again. But now it's not expanding all over the place. It's expanding only around this acorn. And that allows me to see the acorn from every angle because while you guys have been seeing it from here, you have no idea what's going on in this side. And I couldn't see it here. But when my consciousness expands, it's like I start to see the acorn in all its three-dimensionality. It's like my, my, I can grasp all of the acorn at once. And this is the state of being with a meditative mind. And it's a very interesting state to be in because it gives vipassana, it gives insight. If would I, if I, would you, would you call that moment excess concentration when you achieve that moment of complete focus? A moment of what? I think I, some people I've heard define that moment of when you when you're not looking around anymore and you just focus. I've heard that described as excess concentration. Excess, like no ac too much? Ac access, like it's accessible. It's like okay, it's just a different term, I guess. Then okay, yeah, okay. That's why I said about definitions. You call it access concentration and you define it as that. So that's what exactly. it is. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Words are just conventions to help one thought leave this brain and reach another brain. Yeah. That's how I see it. Um, yeah. And so an acorn, I can get some insight on the acorn. It can be quite interesting. But if I were to meditate on, let's say, something, Okay, I, I don't know, uh, an aspect of my personality. And suddenly I would gain insight into that. Well, that would be cool. If yeah. I could see myself from uh, various angles, then, uh, then that would be cool. And this is, this, is, this is what meditation brings. Now, I can also do that with the ultimate universe. I can do that with the mantra Om. And, and realize the depths of the mantra om. How would I know that that is the, the, the basic sound which is resounding in the universe and which created the whole universe? Well, if I meditated on it and I, and I started getting insight on it, it, it's like I would start to, to understand it better. How does, so that it feel, be, how does it feel when you achieve that sort of, when you, when you achieve this sort of access into the meditative field and you're able to gain insight. Like how how does that affect your physiology and your body? Do you feel like uh, relaxed or like how do you feel generally when that's happening? Well, the meditative state of mind doesn't have to pass through the, it, it, the process of concentrating and, and what we call meditating. 
It doesn't have to. I remember one time I was, because it's just a, a state of expansion of consciousness around a specific object, not just all over the place, but around a very specific point. And, and I remember that happened to me when I was, I was just walking down the street and I, I had in the back of my head uh, a relationship that I, that I was like a, a, something with a friend that I was, that I was, that was bothering me. And all of a sudden, I, I just felt, because um, I'm very kinesthetic, so I felt these vibrations, and I could feel something change in my, in my consciousness and my awareness. And, and I saw it in the visual field that suddenly I could see everything. Like it wasn't, usually we're focused uh, just in the center of the, of the visual field. I can't make out details like here. Yeah. Uh, I can't make details out here. And, uh, but, but suddenly everything that was in my field of vision, I was aware of it. And that is one of the signs of, of an altered state of consciousness, of, of an expansion of, of, uh, of consciousness. And that was just like momentary. But then what happened was that it's kind of like I had a flashing forth that I saw the issue with this. I saw the whole picture of, of the situation with my, with my relationship with this friend as if I was looking at it from, from up. It's like I saw everything from, everything was super clear. And it was feeling, it, it was great because I was really stressing around uh, uh, about this uh, relationship. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, okay. It's actually all okay. Now that I can see it all, now that I have the bigger picture, it's actually all okay. Interesting. Um, you mentioned Robert Bruce. Um... I'm just trying to get the chronology right here. Did you, you were studying or you were reading Robert Bruce when you were younger before you could really got into meditation or was that after you got into meditation? No, no, way before. That was one of the first things. That was maybe 12. And like, I don't know which version because he changes his books quite a lot. In his latest version, which I read recently after taking your course, um, in that version, he he actually has a like truncated chapter which he's got a couple of books. One of his books called Energy, New Energy Ways, which is now called Energy Work, I think it's called. And then the new version of Astral Dynamics, he's got like a chapter which covers most of the details of New Energy Ways in there about how to work with energy and stuff. Did you work with that stuff at all when you were reading that, try and move the energy around and stuff? That book wasn't out. <laughs> okay. okay. I read, so. I read uh, printouts of, uh, of something he called um, Astral Projection uh, FAQ. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And that was that was he published that in 1989. I got hold of it in 1990 something. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Interesting. Probably around 1995, 1990. Yeah, something like that. He's actually really knowledgeable, Robert Bruce. You know, I was like, he did a course. He did a video course on Kundalini Awakening, and somebody gifted it to me, and like. um yeah, I didn't. I didn't really find it very good. But his his new energy ways book is. I mean, that changed my life. That book it was unbelievable. But the Kundalini Awakening one just seemed kind of like, it just seemed kind of like an extension of the new energy ways a little bit. But the current version of Astral Dynamics, which I read years ago too, and it didn't really work for me. But rereading it now after taking your course, it was like, oh, now I understand. And he. I did get the vibe that he's actually he's actually an expert astral projector. It was the first time I read it. I was kind of like, because of my own experience wasn't good enough, you know, but now I get it. It might be too good for his own, you know, when somebody's yeah. really an, a, 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 a savant in something, they might not be the best teachers. Yeah. Because it, it comes to them so easy. They may miss, there, there's some stuff that, that was key there. By the way, one of the things uh, in, 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 in this text, which was uh, life-changing for me, was uh, a chapter called uh, The Obstacle of Fear, where he describes how you may hear this really intense sound, the nada, um, that is taking over you, and you might become really afraid. And that is the moment of astralization, because the nada are astral sounds. So your astral yeah. hearing is opening, and you start to hear these sounds and they become really, really intense. Um, and that was a really big game changer for me because until that point, I would, I, would, I would reach that point of hearing that sound and I would run away from it like crazy until he explained how to push through it. And that was quite amazing. 
That's really cool. Yeah, there's a lot of these things you don't, you just need, every book you read gives you a little detail, which helps you. Ah, and that's what your course did for me. Your course did this for me because I go through this thing where I'm meditating and I move into the astral plane. Like I am, it's like, it's crazy. I mean, I can invoke spirits and all this stuff. I don't know what I'm doing, but it's really easy and it's real, but it's different than projection. It's the same thing in some ways because evocation feels the same as actual projection, but it's distinct. But your book, or not your book, sorry, your, your, your course, your video course has a whole bunch of techniques in it about different ways which might work for astral projection. And in the past, I've tried doing stuff like about do, climbing out of the body, and I just I just didn't get it. Oh, I'm starting to get it now. But the big one that you had, which game changing, game changing technique for me was you imagine what was it? You imagine like an astral or, or any object, an astral double, and then you move into it, and then you move back, and then you move into it, and then you move back, and it's like bouncing. And I do all that a lot with energy. And this is what Robert Bruce recommends in New Energy Ways. He recommends bouncing energy up and down your body and moving the energy. And this is the thing. This is why I get into Nidra Yoga, because New Energy Ways is a lot like Nidra Yoga. So Nidra Yoga, you think about your finger. You think about your finger. You think about your palm. And in New Energy Ways, that? what's that? Sure. So when you're when you're speaking about nidra yoga in this moment, you are referring to a very specific type of nidra yoga, which uh, is the, the the one of uh, Satyananda. Um, which is what I learned about. Yeah. Okay. And and which is uh, is is his vi- version of it. Definitely not the traditional yoga nidra. Uh, and from my perspective, does not reach where the traditional yoga nidra reaches. Like his goals, his his the goals that he defines as the goals of his yoga nidra, are not the goals of what yoga nidra uh, uh, traditionally is supposed to be. This is interesting. So, what are the traditional goals of yoga nidra? Well, uh, first of all, yoga nidra is not a. Did you notice that it's called uh, uh, kriya yoga, hatha yoga, and it's not called nidra yoga. It's called yoga nidra. Yeah. Well, you mentioned this in your course. Technique. Yeah. It's a state. It's a state of consciousness. If it were a technique, we would call it Nidra Yoga, which yeah. is one of the things that I bring in the course that I rather call it Nidra Yoga and, and use that as a name for all of these techniques, uh, techniques that, that use sleep in order to reach a yogic state. But this Yoga Nidra is, a, is, is, not, a, is not a technique for using sleep to reach yoga. It's a yogic sleep. It's a certain state of consciousness. And uh, the yogis basically define that, that there are uh, three or four states of consciousness, uh, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, and then one which is beyond. Uh, and we are only conscious in one. When we are conscious in the, in the wakeful state, um, jagrat, then this is this, wakeful state. We're talking, we're used to this. Good. When we are... Uh, conscious during svapna the dream state then we are uh, having a lucid dream and that's why i brought the subject of lucid dreaming into my uh, yoga nidra course because it's a it's 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 in the way it's part it's one step along the way and then for for most uh, western scholars they would say well this is where it ends it's like uh, uh conscious you can be when you're awake you can be conscious when you're dreaming we know that but when you're in deep sleep, you're not supposed to be able to be conscious. And, and then yogis would say, well, no, actually you can be aware in this. And this, when the awareness happens in the deep sleep is what we call yoga nidra. And that is a state of, of, of thoughtlessness because during a dream, there's thoughts. In dream, the brain is, is as active as it is right now. And that's why it's much easier to become lucid in dreams than it is to become lucid in deep sleep. Being lucid in deep sleep is like being in the deepest states of meditation, like in in states of what they call samadhi. Yeah. And and so yoga nidra is is this really, really deep state. And as I said, uh, Swami, I think it's Satyananda, but but now I'm getting confused and I'm thinking maybe it's not Satyananda. (laughs) Well, you know, I was going over your course again today because I haven't actually watched all of it yet. I went through most of it, but I didn't go through a lot of the longer meditations. But the um, uh, 
and then also with this whole war thing that's going on, my mind's been completely distracted from study in the last month. But as I was looking through it again today, you do mention like a whole bunch of different styles of Nidra Yoga. And I was like, oh, because I guess what I know is I read that book, uh, the Satyananda style was a book called Nidra Yoga, which I read and uh, found it really, that was where I made the connection that while well, this is a lot like energy waves and I started trying to use this, but what happened was, and this is why I learned another thing I learned in your course. I didn't realize, like this was like this like blew my mind when I saw your course. Or is like, I didn't realize that nidra yoga and astral projection are very similar in some ways, right? There's a there's a there's a similarity, and like so what what happens to me generally is, uh, and then one of the things this is one of the things I've been doing since I took your course. I've I've actually been trying to bring myself down into like the sleep state and stay conscious. And, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of times I fall asleep, but sometimes I don't and I have some success. But generally, I don't have to go to that state. Generally, if I just focus on the kundalini and the body and I can just feel it moving around and stuff and then five minutes and I can start having visions like pretty quickly. But so yoga nidra yeah? will be beyond those visions. What would I happen so. if those visions were to to stop? Yeah, I don't know. I wonder what would happen. So that's well, I, the, the the theory is that you would be left with uh, what is there when there is nothing else there, which is yourself. And since yoga, in general, is is a journey for recognizing who we truly are, which the yogis yeah. say is pure consciousness. Uh, in in all in all these states, including states of astral projection, which is very much like lucid dreaming. And so, as I said, it's, it's being aware in the dream state, which is in the direction, but not yet the deep sleep. Um, it, it opens us up to recognize that we are not this physical body that, that, that we usually think ourselves to be. Um, but it's still in the world of, of there's a big jump between lucid dreaming and the actual state of, of yoga nidra, where there's nothing. There's nothing. Even you, who the you that you think that you are, yeah, is not there. So you're you're saying that nidra yoga actually the state of nidra yoga is actually this. It's actually like um, the state of awakening, really, right? It's like being awake completely. Like it's almost like the moment of enlightenment kind of thing. It's complete self. Yes, it's just self. That's really cool. Um, now, and then, I don't know if you meant, did you mention this in your course? I think you did. But the um, the first person who did Nidra Yoga was Krishna. Was that who it was? I remember reading this somewhere. Um, and I don't know if it was your course or I read it in the book. But apparently that one of the, that I think it was like the state of Nidra Yoga was some, one of the, one of the deities, one of the female deities put the, put Krishna to sleep or was it Shiva? I can't remember what it is. And then um, that was. That yeah. was the state, that was the original state of yoga need or something like that. But um, well, we need to decode that story uh, to 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 fully understand it. But 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 yes, sometimes yoga nidra is the state because Vishnu creates uh, uh, creates the world and then resorbs the world as he goes to sleep. And this sleep is the yoga nidra. And yeah. that's a metaphor for for how we see the external world in the wakeful consciousness and it seems to disappear into our own essence as we enter into the, the yoga nidra because when I close my eyes, the external world disappears, but the internal world appears as you were saying, the images start to appear. And this is still a world, although the astral world, but then even that world gets reabsorbed, uh, resorbed into, into my consciousness. And then I am left with just nothings. And this is the yoga nidra, yoga, yoga nidra state. And in that story, it's Vishnu, uh, it's which Vishnu. is Chris okay. an incarnation of Vishnu, uh, which uh, uh, creates the universe and then goes back to sleep. And when Vishnu sleeps, the universe does not exist. In the same way that for us, when we are in the yoga nidra state, the universe doesn't exist. Another version of the story incorporates that yoga nidra is, is a female deity um that wakes him up from this sleep so 
Uh, at one time it's the name of the sleep, but one time it's the name of the deity that, that wakes him up from the sleep. But that's the story behind it. And yes, I, I do mention it in the course. You know, there's a lot of people online and on YouTube and videos, they talk about astral projection. And um, it just seems like so much, they have so much fun and they're going to different dimensions and and they're, you know, it's it just seems so great and easy. But, you know, like, um, uh, my, my, you know, I, I do a lot of evocation, like a lot. Um, but the, uh, the experience I had, the first experience I had astral projecting while I was doing your course, which was, I think of that as like formal astral projection. Um, actually, let me ask you a question. Do you, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, like, this, it, to me, this is, I take this, I believe this to be true. I believe that you can project I can. I believe you can move into the astral world in a variety of ways. One of them is projection. You can also enter into it without leaving your body, right? You can stay mm -hmm. in your body and project, and you can see astrally. You can evoke. You can do all this stuff. But then, so like, so I did that like every day, basically. But the actual process of projection was so jaw dropping to me. Like when I did that after doing your course, that, that just blew me. I'm gonna have to use because it becomes word. real. I it can was close unbelievable, my eyes. Dude. I see the astral, but it's like the feeling is is that it's my imagination, and the astral is the world of imagination. But as I as I sit and I become aware of it, it's very hazy. This feels real. I see this with my eyes, but this now, when I close my eyes, it's there, but it's hazy. But if I drop this physical body, which is creating the 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 the, um, the darkness, I mean the the physical darkness is just creating because my my brain is now producing like there's no signal coming from this eye, and so it's it's producing in my consciousness the the color dark brown because there's sunlight coming. In. But once I don't have this, suddenly everything becomes super clear. Yeah, the the experience like I was as I was saying I was bouncing back and forth between and I was and it's funny because like I'm imagining like a shape of me like a, the the astral double and I can't even visualize it very well I'm like dude this is not gonna work and I'm like so I move into it and I don't really feel it and I move back and I move into it, I don't really feel it and I move back now before I did all this stuff I did what Robert Bruce suggests which is before I did it I was doing sort of pranayama through the chakras and all this stuff so I was energized right. And so I'm moving into it, and, uh, and then I go over there, and all of a sudden, I'm there, I'm in. But it was the most astounding, jaw-dropping moment in a long time. And it was just like the, uh, the, the um, awareness of the self was inhabiting an imaginary object. And all of a sudden, the imaginary object becomes real as a result of being inhabited by awareness. Right? What the fuck is going on? Excuse my language. It's just so jaw dropping. I just blew me away. It blew me away that that was that happened. And then, um, and then the implications of that is that I'm imagining a natural double. But the shamanic thing to do is, you can imagine anything. You can imagine a raven or a cheetah, or if like you're an ayahuasca guy, like uh, a jaguar in the jungle or whatever, right? So you could you could project into anything with your awareness. Um, and, you know, this is why, and I think we spoke about this previously, where, you know, a lot of people talk about actual projecting, but maybe they're not really projecting, because I think, after that experience, I think that most people are talking about astral projection haven't really projected, because, because if they had, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think they have a lot more reverence for the experience, because it's like a spirit, it's a deeply spiritual experience, it is deeply, I mean, to me, that was like, that was one of the highest spiritual realities. And it's kind of scary because if you look at the implications, if it's true that you can move your awareness into imaginary objects, and it is, that's uh, that's uh, crazy. What do you think? What do you think the, um, and this is like a stupid question a little bit, but what do you think the, perp I mean, there's no purpose, but what is the purpose of astral projection? Like the purpose of it is to, is for us to become like, 
to awaken ourselves or whatever, I guess, right? But there's, there's, I don't know. I, I think, I think things can be given a purpose. Like, like asking for a purpose is, is, is asking to, you, you need to choose between two questions. You can ask what is the function of it? Yeah. Or what, what, like what function does it serve? And uh, in a sense, it serves the function of dreaming. Uh, a dream is an astral projection, just not an, uh, an aware one. Um, so that is the basic purpose of being able to move consciousness in this way. It has something to do with perception. But then the question is, what meaning can you make of it? And that's a different question. Um, and when it comes to meaning, yes, you can turn it into a process of awakening. You can, you can uh, uh, use it for healing. You can use it for exploring. You can use it for studying. You can use it for learning. And you can say, that it is a, a preparation for what happens when we leave the body. Um, because we spend a little time, according to traditions, in this body and uh, a lot of time outside of this body, normally, unless you, you choose to consciously reincarnate and, and continue evolution. Um, and so it can, it can serve that as well. You've had quite a lot of experience in India, and I think you went to Tibet, and you've certainly studied with Tibetan teachers. But not in Tibet, in, in okay. India. Um, sure. Yeah. But do you do, is there a role for astral projection in those in those yes. pathways? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes, you've yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And what so what is the what is the role in those in those traditions? Like uh Oof. how much time how much more time do we have for this talk? Because uh <laughs> yeah, we got about 10 minutes, 10 minutes and we're done. Okay. <laughs> There's Too no much. way of answering that. Okay. But I, I'll answer in short that in, in the Tibetan traditions and in the Indian traditions as well, there's a whole ecology that is happening in the astral realm. And the truth, the same goes for the shamanic uh, uh, traditions of, of, of South America and other shamanic traditions. There's a whole ecology. There's a whole um, um, bureaucracy which is happening in the, in, the astral, uh, in the astral planes. And so, you know, it's like when, 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 you, when you open yourself up to the idea that there is a, 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 a hidden universe, um, then we, you know, it, it almost seems silly to assume. It, it's almost like assuming that we are the center of the universe like the earth is the center of the universe. Yeah. It's also silly to assume that, that the physical realm is the center of the universe. And so there's a whole bureaucracy happening in the astral realm. Crazy, crazy stuff. I can tell you that, that one of the stories uh, that is told about uh, my, my main Tibetan teacher is that he had students in Tibet and he would astrally project at night and go and teach them. Amazing. So cool. It's just so unbelievable. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, like our modern society is like, you know, there's this whole movement to like move into the metaverse and to, to create this sort of artificial fake version of what we should be doing, which is moving into the internal world, right? And um, yeah, yeah don't get me started on the metaverse. Please. Oh, yeah. It, oh, seriously, it's so disgusting. It's gonna, me, like, I, I, I think it's going to make so much damage, so much damage. I mean, you know, it's I'm, yeah. it's kind of setting up my 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 future. I'm going to have a lot of work as a therapist, but it's right. it's going to really mess people up. Yeah, because even... the whole thing, the whole thing is based on. It's weird because, like, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it, I mean, it, I don't want to say demonic because it's got so many like um, it's got so many like associations with it. But in a way, the metaverse is based on. The fulfillment of desire, right? And by what well, is by the is by the proffering of choices which seem attractive. There's no conscious decisions made on this level. Whereas the the astral projection state is achieved by the the negation of desire, right? Now, my experience, my experience with like spiritual forces is that desire invokes the demonic eventually. It might not do it at first. Um, yeah. if you focus energy on it and you 
you like cheat if you achieve concentration on desire yeah bad things can happen and so this yeah so i think a lot of this this kind of thing happens but i think uh sorry in spirituality in spirituality desire usually blocks things when you when you really want to achieve something you usually don't get it um there needs to be a surrendering and a letting go before that happens so that when it, that's my my view of desires and it's true desire if we define demons as being thought forms uh which are destructive desire is destructive uh it's voracious it's it's eating and it will never stop eating once you start fulfilling desires they will just create more and more desires to be fulfilled and this is what the buddhist teachings so personally for me the metaverse my problem with it is that it's depersonalizing people um yeah that when when we're even this video i have to move really close to the camera uh for you to start to see any kind of my micro expressions in in my face yeah. and it's it's like we need that to remain human um and when we were, i feel people are going to lose lose contact with one another i think we're anyhow forgetting how to how to communicate uh and that's causing so much trouble in the world but when things go into the metaverse and and our brain can't get the cues that it's that it that, that it's used to imagine the 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 insecurity like you don't have information when when someone is talking to me i i feel if i want to be close to them if i don't want to be close to them i might be wrong you know i can feel if they're aggressive or if they're calm i might be wrong but at least i'm getting the information and if i go into this metaverse and i can get the point of of you know like uh, having like the glasses that you put and you get get your google maps and it shows you that i'm i i'm i'm kind of half down with that but this whole thing of avatars that i create me myself and the vision that i want to to create that could be okay maybe if it could really capture all of me but it can't and so i feel that this metaverse will be really connecting a lot of people but also very superficially something is going to to get lost there and i feel that that thing that is going to get lost is going to cause a lot of trouble I've never done a vipassana retreat but I've read a bunch of vipassana books and there was one book I'm really into like uh, meditation on the elements right like in a big way that's like my thing and the uh I read this one book it was I can't remember what the book's called it's one of the official books from the vipassana but they talk about meditation on the elements and uh I guess the way they do it in vipassana is they're doing it like they there's like soft and hard parts of the body and you think about those soft and the hard parts and you associate those with the elements and then you go deeper and deeper but then as you go deeper and deeper into the structure of the body you start getting into like almost to the molecular level and you're sort of moving into like like uh beyond the body you're moving into a like conscious structures which are no longer in the body and so consciousness in its highest state is focused on the structure of consciousness inside the human form and that was that's really amazing to me it seems to me the thing with the metaverse is that what happens is the only thing that can happen is you start focusing your consciousness on uh a representation of what the body is like an avatar right and that's not going to lead you to who you are it's going to lead you to the micro electronic structure of something else which isn't human well i think it's going to lead you into nowhere because it doesn't really exist in in a sense you got you, yeah. you you will get into these electrons and these pixels and into the code yeah. and the, yeah no it's just not the, it's just not the way it's yeah. just not the way hey um in my uh, you know? i'm going to try and wrap up so i don't keep you on all day here talking but i've just got another question here is that i noticed like like we're talking we started about like how you're a therapist and you deal with trauma and combat trauma and um sexual trauma and other kinds of trauma and i'm wondering um have you dealt with anybody who's had psychedelic trauma psych like taking psychedelic drugs Yes I I I I deal with uh what is considered it's termed spiritual emergencies because they're both an emergency and an emergence of something. Yes I I I I deal with these things as well. It's best with these things to be present in someone's presence. It's not good to do this uh so much online unfortunately. It can but 
it's better to do this personally exactly for the reason maybe this is i was wondering why we're talking about the metaverse but i think now it's uh now now it's come up uh, uh some things can be done online some things cannot this is really confusing if i try if somebody's having something in their astral body and something's going i can't i can't get into their astral body uh uh to feel what's going on there unless i met them personally interesting okay like 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 my teacher can project halfway across the world and do whatever he wants sure. um i can't I can okay. help somebody who's who's right next to me, and if they were next to me uh, uh, for uh, for uh, for a while, I can still kind of feel them. But if I try to reach in through the screen, it's it's like it's getting confused. It's like, where are you? You know? Um, yeah. So yeah, these things happen. People uh, 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 take all sorts of mind altering substances, and and certain doors become open in them, and sometimes these doors don't close all the way. Sometimes they don't open properly, um, and and people can enter into all sorts of states of consciousness, which are uh, somewhere between being really really elevated and going crazy. Yeah, and it's a fine line. Um, yeah you want to make the question more specific i mean i went i went through this you know i went part of the reason i started my channel was because i had did one of these spiritual awakenings from doing a lot of medicine and mm -hmm. boom all of a sudden it was like everything was open and like evil i was evoking things without knowing what was going on so i started the channel because i thought at the time 10 years ago there was all these videos about people oh ayahuasca it's so beautiful it changed my life and i'm like dude it's more than that. There's something else going on here. Like I just had the, no, I did it for a couple of years, but still there's a lot more to it than just like, uh, oh, I had 10 years of therapy. And so yeah, part of it is that, I guess, just thinking about the realities. So perhaps I'll give an advice uh, if, if somebody's listening to this and this is happening to them. Um, find someone that is properly initiated and that has done a lot of work um don't go looking for advice from people who are oh i can help you and no no when this happens because uh, as i said i don't know if you need all of these initiations or not but yeah. when something like this happens don't take chances go to someone who really is a master um um or at least is connected with them. There's a lot of neo shamans and people who are self-proclaimed shamans and self-proclaimed teachers and gurus and this kind of stuff. You know, I, I, can, I can share with you a story. Um, I, I one of my students uh, was entering into these states, and it was fine. I, I didn't want to bother my teacher with it. I felt I could handle this. And at a certain point, um, sh this student entered like they were starting to really fly and i was starting to get worried like I, I i deal with quite extreme stuff so you can you can imagine that that this was quite extreme um and i was look i i i just i have i can feel there's one technique i i i, I can use in this in this situation that that i was taught uh and i used that technique and her body temperature like she 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 was in in one moment she was like you know like this all over the place really going crazy the next moment this was over but her body temperature rose to 40 degrees celsius wow. and at this point i i was like okay enough i gotta i gotta call my teacher because he, he taught me how to do these things but but this is it you know it's like it's expected that the, that the temperature is going to rise but i'm not the master here i don't know if it's going to rise beyond 40 and you know if it's going to get really dangerous so i called him and he was like no, no, perfect. This is how it's good. You you did well. This is how it's supposed to go. Don't worry. I will I will check if anything needs to happen at night. And at night he 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 flew, you know, a few thousand miles in his astral body, checked her and in the morning. I was like, yeah, no, everything's fine. You don't need to do anything. So either work with somebody who really knows what they're doing, or work with somebody who's connected to that. And this is why initiation was, was, was really a thing. 
because people can self-proclaim, but when you have a lineage, when you have a teacher that verifies another teacher and verifies another teacher, it tends to be safer. I'm not gonna say it's the safest thing in the world because I've seen crazy people proclaim to be gurus by other gurus and it's just, I've, I've seen this, um, but it, it is safer. And I would say not somebody who thinks that they are the incarnation of God, someone who's humble. If someone's humble, that's a, that's a good, uh, you know, if they think that, that they are speaking and God is speaking through them, yeah. then I would stay away from that. Maybe God is speaking through them, but again, it's, it's a danger zone. It, it attracts also people because if, if, if somebody that's the universal consciousness is speaking through them, they usually don't say that. They keep it yeah. to themselves. Yeah. It's a lack of consciousness about what's actually happening to them at that moment. And like what they're like, if you're talking about that, you're not really being aware of what your situation is with the person you're talking to. Right. It's like a lack of awareness in some way. Yeah. Well, well, Tomer, listen, um, I'm going to let you go. I've had you on for a while. Tomer Weiss, uh, really interesting conversation. Really good course. I'm going to post your course down below here because it was like really one is just the best structured course that I've seen about the subject and it's really comprehensive. It covers so much information and it's like, it's well done. It's comprehensive and organized and structured. It was a really good course. Um, this is why we're talking. What's that? Let, let me, what, what, I, what I would suggest, I, I will give you my website, uh, oh, yeah. tomer-weiss.com and people can, uh, can visit through there. Um, and, uh, you can find all of my courses on, on this uh, website as well. I have other, other yeah. courses um, and you can, you can access it through there. And then it also uh, uh, credits me in a sense. Um, That's tomer.weiss.com? Uh, Tomer-weiss. Weiss. Oh, the Weiss. Yeah. Okay. Dot com. Yeah. Uh, W-E-I-S-S. Uh, we'll, we'll have the link uh, for yeah. everyone. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I have the, the Yoga Nidra course there. I have the Lucid Dreaming course there. Uh, I've got a, a migraine relief uh, method that I, that I have there as well. Um, and um, I'm, I have this new uh, course for overcoming panic attacks, um, which, is, uh, which has been, I've, I've just finished it a couple of months ago. And right now I'm working on two pretty, pretty big things. And I don't know exactly when they're going to be released, but one of them is, is meditation. It's going to be a very comprehensive course in the same way that I took Yoga Nidra. But imagine Yoga Nidra is just one technique. I'm going to try to cover a wide range of meditations and approaches. And, and so wow. it's, a, it's, a, it's a big course. And at some point, I'm going to put my uh, yoga method. I, I have my own way of practicing yoga. Um, which is uh, looking at yoga as a, 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 a both a body-oriented psychotherapy technique and at the same time a transpersonal psychotherapy technique, um, and that that's going to be a massive one. I have no idea when that one is going to come out, but uh, that will be my 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 vision of things. So that's what you can look for, and and it's going to be on the website. So if you're watching this a year after we filmed this, two years after we filmed this, maybe it's already online. You can access it through there. Really nice. Well, Tom, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. That was really interesting. Um, it's interesting to talk to people who've actually got the sort of legitimate experience rather than just the fly by night. I took too many drugs, people like myself, you know, so that's cool. Um, anyway, yeah, thanks for coming on. And um, maybe sometime I'll convince you to come talk to talk about the... Um, about the purpose of uh, astral projection and Buddhism sometime. <laughs> the sure. big topic, the big topic. But yeah, sure. thanks, Tomer. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.